Hello, everyone. Um, before we get started, please just note that this webinar is being recorded, um, and it will be posted on the Quasi website after uh, afterwards. Feel free to post any questions uh, in the question box below, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. But uh, let's get started. So I'm Julia Masterman. I'm the Science Education and Outreach Coordinator at Quasi. Uh, and welcome to our second Summer Institute 2020 Overview Webinar. Today, Trey Flowers, Director of, of the Analysis and Prediction Division of the NOAA National Water Center Office of Water Prediction, will provide an introduction to the National Water Model, and then I'm going to give some program details and application requirements for this year's Summer Institute. Uh, again, at the end, we'll have some time for questions, so please feel free to put them in the chat um, throughout the talk, and we'll circle back to those at the end. But for now, uh, with that, I'll pass it off to Trey Flowers to speak more about the National Water Model. Trey? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Julia. So um, my name is Trey Flowers, and the, um, the, the work that we do, so I, I lead the division that um, develops the National Water Model here at the National Water Center in beautiful Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to go through today and chat with you a little bit about what we're doing to develop and improve the national water model. So I, I'd like to start this story with a discussion of how did we get here. And about, uh, it's been about seven or eight years ago now, the um, precursor to the Office of Water Prediction, the, that, that's the home office of the National Water Center, um, recognize that we, we have to evolve our water prediction capabilities within the National Weather Service. And we started on a, a stakeholder campaign where we went to people from around the country, um, local governments, federal partners, academic partners. We went to different watershed commissions, um, essentially went out and talked to anybody who would talk to us and ask them, what keeps you up at night about your water resources? And we had a, a couple of themes that floated up to the top. Um, and these, these five themes are they. Uh, we, people were concerned about flooding, drought, the availability of water, um, uh, water the quality of that water, and the uncertainty associated with, with climate change. How would the the, their access to water resources change um, in, in, the, in, in the coming years. And there was, a, um, there was a very clearly identified need to provide a consistent, high level, um, very high resolution, even down to the street level, um, analysis and prediction capability for water resources. And NOAA um, took that very seriously um, and began to work with our, our um, appropriators on um, Capitol Hill and came up with a, a couple of what we call program change summaries. And these are the things that really have, have um, guided what we do with the, with the national water model. So in 2015, we received our first, um, our, our first uh, um, tranche of funding to begin development of the National Water Model. Um, that initial um, um, program change summary, centralized water forecasting demonstration, that um, uh, gave us the funding to begin uh, the demonstration project for the National Water Model, um, uh, data services that supported the National Water Model, and an evaluation service that um, not only supported the national water model, but supported the, the current forecasting capability. That was followed in 2016 with um, uh, authorization and funding to work on hyper-resolution modeling, um, real-time flood inundation forecast mapping, um, and um, improving our, our decision support uh, services. And in 17, we, we had additional funding to stand up an operations center here at the National Water Center to increase our high performance computing capacity and also to begin the process of coupling uh, terrestrial and uh, so freshwater and saltwater models 
in the in the coastal boundary. Um, so I, I show this slide particularly for the Summer Institute people because a lot of the themes of the past Summer Institute and, and the current Summer Institute are born out of out of these program change summaries. The very first Summer Institute was held here at the National Water Center in 2015, right after we received funding for National Water Model development. The National Water Model was prototyped for the first time at, in the Summer Institute. So people like uh, like you did some of the very early work on the on the National Water Model. Uh, we have worked on the um, decision support services through our hydroinformatics theme. That has been a fairly consistent theme through the first five summer institutes, and has returned for for this year. Hyper resolution modeling was a was a theme for us the last couple of years. Um, flood inundation mapping has been a theme for the summer institute. We also um, last year and again this year have started working on the, the coupling of the freshwater models to the to the, the saltwater models in the Summer Institute. And I say this because um, I, I'm, I'm really, this, this is a program that is extraordinarily important to us here at the National Water Center because it helps us to engage with our, our community of students. It helps you um, as students to get to know your peers. Um, and it really helps us to advance the the, the work that Congress has has asked us to do. Um, so just before we get too too far along, I want to make sure that I, I thank you as prospective students for considering coming and um, working on some of the the nation's greatest water challenges. So I've already teased it a little bit. Born out of that that summer institute and subsequently developed is the national water model. So the national water model is a first of its kind continental scale uh, water prediction tool that runs in an operational environment here right alongside the the operational weather forecasting models the national water model has been running since august 6th of 2016. so you'll be um, leading up to the fourth birthday of the national water model in operations here um, in within the um, within the NOAA community and what the National Water Model does is it provides intelligence where no intelligence had previously been available. Our current forecasting capabilities um, shown in, in this slide in the blue lines only covers about 120,000 river miles in the country. We have all the major river uh, all the major rivers and waterways covered, um, but that's only about 120,000 river miles out of a total of 5 million river miles that, um, that are in the, in the NHD Plus uh, network. So the National Water Model, and those are shown here in, in red, the National Water Model produces a forecast at each one of these areas, or each one of these, these along each one of these 5 million river miles. Um, and we do this at a, at, at a frequency shown in, in this slide. So we have, four different um, uh, cycles to the national water model. We have an analysis cycle where we assimilate USGS stream flow observations, and um, we, we use that, that information to correct the forecast going forward. We have a short range forecast that is based off of the high resolution rapid refresh um, precipitation information. That is the best available information um, from the zero to the, the 18 hour. Um, so we produce an 18-hour forecast using the HER um, wrap. We have a medium-range ensemble forecast that is based off of the, the global forecast system that goes out to about 10 days. And we have a long-range ensemble forecast that goes out to the um, 30 days. Uh, we, we run that on an ensemble as well, and that's based on the a downscale climate forecast system. So in the previous slide, I, I said that we uh, forecast on 5 million river miles. A, uh, that, that's about 2.7 million locations where we provide a forecast. So in the, in the short range configuration, where every hour we're producing a forecast out to 18 hours, 
uh, at 2.7 million locations. And that just one variable alone, just stream flow alone, we're producing over a billion pieces of forecast data a day. So that does not include the medium or long range ensemble uh, stream flow forecast data. And it doesn't include the other data that we output via the national water model, such as snowpack, soil moisture, um, essentially all the variables that we need to close the water balance over the U.S. Um, we we uh, provide a forecast on and we, we um, calculate that data at the same frequency that, we, uh, that, that I'm showing in this slide. So it's rather mind-boggling to think um, how, how much data the national water model is, is actually producing. And so how do we go about doing this? The national water model is based um, currently off of the Wharf Hydro core. And I'll get into why I say currently a little later in, in today's discussion. Um, so we, we use the, the NHD Plus network as our organizing principle. That's, that's our, our hydro fabric that we use. We, we hydro condition the NHD Plus network and use that to, um, to uh, route water through, through the country. We, we have a forcings engine that brings the, the precipitation data and the atmospheric data into the model. Um, uh, we have a, a USGS stream flow observation that we bring in and we assimilate that data. And the black box shown here in this slide is really the, the calculation engine of the national water model. We um, bring the precipitation data in and we calculate the amount of water that infiltrates into the subsurface and the amount that runs off of the land surface. We route the water that runs off of the land surface through a terrain routing model that's on a 250 meter grid. We aggregate the, um, that, that information in NHD plus catchments, and then we route that through a, our, our channel and, and reservoir routing modules. Um, and from this, we are able to create the, the, the forecast and, um, and visualize that, that forecast. So getting a little um, deeper into the, the processes that we use to generate the forecast, we, we use NOAA MP as our, as our land surface model. Um, we use uh, overland, for overland flow, we use a 1D um, diffusive wave routing technique. Um, once water has infiltrated into the subsurface, we use uh, 2D Boussinesca scheme to, to route the water laterally. And then deeper groundwater is, um, is handled using a very conceptual uh, bucket flow model. We then route the, the um, water through the, the hydrofabric using um, hydrologic routing, uh, the muskingum coon routing method. And we have a um, water management solution that is basically a fill and spill um, uh, solution. So the reason, one of the reasons why I like this slide very, very much is that this shows where we are now, but a point that I always like to make is we have projects going on right now where we are changing each and every one of these things. Um, the national water model is not static. It, it has, um, I'll get into this a little later, but we are continuously upgrading it and continuously improving it. Um, we recognize that the way we're doing things now is not the way we want to do things in the future. And so it's incredibly important to us to have the, the students coming in for the Summer Institute to help us work on, on these types of issues. What is the most appropriate overland flow um, um, routing scheme to use? Is routing necessary on a 250 meter grid at a one hour time step? That was a question that, um, that, that we were posing last year. Um, NOAA MP, is that our most appropriate um, infiltration um, calculation for the national water model? I believe at this point we have come to the conclusion that it is not. And we had um, one of the summer institute themes this year is going to be around runoff generation processes 
helping it to inform how we evolve the land surface model within the national water model. And so even though the water model is an operational model, it is very much in, in development, rapid development. It's very much in flux. And the participants in the Summer Institute have the opportunity to come and help us set the direction of um, uh, the development direction for the National Water Model. We learn quite a bit from the work that you do, and it's been extraordinarily useful to us in our, our planning and programming. So, as I said, we, we are rapidly developing the National Water Model. Um, the, the foundational, the, the first version was released on August 16th of 2016. That was version 1.0. It has undergone three operational upgrades since then. Um, that's been a, a very aggressive schedule. Um, we, we updated it first in May of, of 17 and March of 2018. Um, uh, we are on our, our third upgrade, which was released on June 19th of 2019. Um, so during last year's Summer Institute, we, we released uh, version 2.0 of the National Water Model. Um, 2.1, we are calibrating that version right now. Um, that should be released in fall of 2020. And we are in development of the version 3.0 and the next generation of the National Water Model now. And I'll get into what we're going to be doing in all of these areas uh, late, later on in today's discussion. So we, we are, are on a very aggressive path towards, um, towards development. And so I'll, I'll say what we have, some of the more important accomplishments that we have done. Um, in version 2.0, uh, we extended the, the, the domain of the national water model to the Hawaiian Islands and we are producing an operational forecast outside of the continental U.S. Um, in the Hawaiian Islands for the first time. That, that's quite an accomplishment for uh, an agency that has been around as long as the Weather Service has. Um, so medium range ensembles, that was another um, um, feather in our cap in version 2.0. And improving our, our calibration, we're using a 40-year climatology to, uh, as the foundational data set to, um, to calibrate the model, and um, a couple of other, other enhancements. And so we'll switch gears a little bit, and we'll start talking about what, what is coming in version 2.1. So this is what is currently under, under um, calibration. I believe we're regionalizing the calibration now. Um, and doing some, some, other, some other testing. We should have uh, version 2.1 in the formal testing process uh, a little later this winter and uh, beginning of spring. One of the most important things that we're doing in version 2.1 is we are continuing to expand the domain. And so we will be incorporating the, um, the, the Laurentian drainage basin uh, the Great Lakes Drainage Basin will be incorporating that into the National Water Model, as well as Lake Champlain. Um, this is work that was um, um, uh, done in partnership with um, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory and, um, and so our, our partners at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, another thing that we're quite, quite proud of is we're going to be expanding the domain to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So here's a, um, a, a, a visual of the, the hydrofabric in, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh, this is designed in partnership with our Southeast River Forecast Center and our Puerto Rico Weather Forecast Office. Um, here's our complete list of, of improvements. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail. But I will highlight a few things in addition to the, the, the domain expansion. Um, we're going to be improving our, our reservoir um, handling. Remember I said we were uh, modeling reservoirs using a fill and spill technique. We, have, um, we are going to be updating that in version 2.1. 
And we're going to be taking uh, observation data, either from USGS observations or for the, from the Army Corps of Engineers. And we're going to be bringing that data into the model in real time and using that, um, that data to correct our, our reservoir forecast. Um, we're also going to be implementing a uh, real-time data feeds from our river forecast centers and bringing the, um, the, the river forecast center forecast that reservoirs into the national water model. So we think this will have a considerable improvement on skill. Um, another thing that we're going to be doing is um, implementing an open loop version of the, of the model that is not corrected by stream flow data assimilation. So very exciting things are coming in version 2.1 that will be released hopefully around um, this time next calendar year. So um, further looking into national water model um, evolution, uh, version 3.0, I said we are actively um, working in on version 3.0 on the development. We've been in development for about two months now. Um, this is going to be a very uh, unique experience for us since for the first time we have more than a few months of development time available to us for a version of the National Water Model. Um, the operational onboarding process is quite cumbersome, and it usually takes about six to eight months for us to, to um, get a, a model approved for the, the operational supercomputing system here at, at NOAA. And so we've had very little time um, in, the, in the previous three upgrades to um, make significant improvements to the model. Luckily, um, this year, or well, let me not say it luckily, but, but this year we are um, refreshing our weather and climate operational supercomputing system. And that presents an opportunity. So what, what that means is we will not be able to um, onboard a model for about 15 months um, from November of 2021 until about February of 2022 are the, the people who uh, maintain and run the operational supercomputing system, they're going to be focused on the, on the refresh. And so we will not be able to hand the model off for onboarding. We're going to be onboarding in um, late calendar year 2020, and we will not have another model onboarded, um, deployed into operations until um, sometime in 2022 after the moratorium has been, has been lifted. And so we are going to tackle um, a couple of very ambitious things in, in this version of the model. And we'll, we'll go into a bit of the detail here. Um, so as I said, we've, we've come to the conclusion that NOAA MP is not the most appropriate land surface model for us to partition rainfall between runoff and infiltration. Um, one of the things that we're going to take a very hard look at is how do we improve um, uh, upon NOAA MP in version 3.0 of the model. Um, also, shallow groundwater, the, the 2D um, Boussinet scheme, um, that, that's really not a, a very accurate depiction. It doesn't um, close the water balance very well. We have um, a, a couple of major connections. Um, such as uh, stream flow uh, being lost and recharging groundwater. That's not a connection that is made in the national water model yet. And I think that we can do a little bit of a better job in representing the, the subsurface processes of the, uh, in, in the national water model. So this is something that we are um, doing in collaboration with the United States Geological Survey. Um, USGS is a, is a value partner of ours, and um, um, one of their, their, their best and brightest is a theme leader again this year. Um, the, the groups that, uh, his name is uh, David Blodgett, the groups that David um, led last year did some of the, the greatest cutting-edge work at the Summer Institute, 
and um, so it's it's a uh, it's definitely an honor and privilege to have um, have David back. So um, other things that we are working on in um, in version 3.0. Um, as I said, we have Muskingum Kunj uh, routing as our inland routing technique. Muskingum Kunj, the, the great thing about that is that um, it is robust. It doesn't crash. It um, um, is a rapid calculation, which we need in producing um, over a billion uh, pieces of forecast data um, within our uh, within a, a day a day cycle. But the problem is, is it's not very accurate. So we see national water model hydrographs that are very flashy. They um, tend to arrive before the, the forecast peak, and they tend to recede very rapidly um, until we hit the, uh, a base flow tail that is an artifact of the, the NOAA MP model. Um, we believe that the, the flashy nature of the, the routing in the national water model is due to the unrealistic assumptions of the Muskingum and Coons routing scheme and that, um, that that we can improve upon this. So we have work going on. Um, we had a, a hydraulics project in Summer Institute of 2018 that is um, forming the foundation of some of the work that we're doing on the hydraulic routing support in the, in the national water model. Um, so this is something that we are going to release. Um, we're not sure of the domain yet, um, but we're going to release some hydraulic routing capability in version 3.0 of the National Water Model. This is an active area of um, research and development for us right now. The second major development in this area that we are that we are pursuing is um, the, the coupling of the um, freshwater national water model to um, the appropriate saltwater models. We have one of our theme leaders this year is from the National Ocean Service, and um, they're the developers of the, of, of the, the saltwater models. Um, and one, one of the, the challenges here is that the saltwater models don't handle freshwater processes very well, and the freshwater models don't handle um, saltwater uh, models very well. Uh, excuse me. So, sorry about that. Um, so the the freshwater models do not handle the the saltwater processes very well, and as a result. In the, in the transition zone between freshwater and saltwater, the estuarine zones, we do not have um, very good forecast skill. And you might say, well, that's okay because nobody ever lives near an estuary. And, um, you know, I, I, would, I would laugh at that joke, uh, say, yeah, it's very funny, because about a third of our, our country's population um, lives in, the, um, in these estuarine zones. And so it's critically important for us to build a skillful, um, a, a skillful forecast that takes into account um, influences from freshwater and influences of saltwater in the, in the estuary and transition zone. Um, so this is another feature that we will be uh, rolling out in version 3.0. This is another very active area of research um, th this is a very active uh, area of research for us. So um, the last thing that I want to talk about with version 3.0, and by the way, coastal coupling is a theme of this year's uh, Summer Institute, so you will be helping us in this very active area of research should you come to Tuscaloosa next summer. Um, the last thing that, that I want to talk about is expansion to the, um, the, the Alaska domain. Um, Alaska is very, um, Alaska is a very tricky um, aspect for us. Oh, shoot. Alaska is very tricky for us because the hydrofabric isn't even um, developed yet. So we um, do not, we, we produce a forecast up there now 
but it does not cover very much of the state. So we will be further expanding domain into um, the, the Alaska domain, primarily looking at the Cook Inlet and the, and the Copper River Basin. We'll eventually be um, transitioning to much more of the state. Um, one of the interesting things about this is cold region processes will likely be a theme of the 2021 Summer Institute. So um, stay tuned, uh, very important information, or very important work will be coming up in, um, on, on that later. So that's, that's what we have in process right now. Um, one of the challenges that we have is the, the, the model that, that is currently, as it's currently architected, in many ways limits the science that we're, we're able to do. Um, the, the, the Wharf Hydro is a, is a fairly um, a mature research code that has um, been developed over a, a fairly long, um, long period of time. And it, it has certain limitations in um, how we're able to work with it, what we're able to do. Um, one of the, the biggest drawbacks that we have is we have a heterogeneous physical representation throughout the entire country, and which means that we treat, uh, and this is very important for the infiltration processes, we treat infiltration and groundwater um, dynamics the same in Arizona as we do in Alabama, as we do in Maine, and as we do in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the, the, the dominant processes that, that govern how water moves through the environment are fundamentally different in those areas of the country. Um, right now, the current version of the model does not allow us to, um, to adjust the, the physics of the model in, in, those, in those different regions. And so we are undertaking a... Um, what we're calling the National Water Model Next Generation. And we're, we're undertaking this, this endeavor to re-architect the National Water Model. We're essentially going to um, erase the board and start over from the fundamental building blocks of the National Water Model and create a purpose-built uh, model that, um, um, for continental scale water prediction. Um, and in order to do this, we have to be successful in three different areas. So I'll get in. So those three areas are we have to have a, an active um, community. Um, next generation water development is all going to be about open source community development of the model. Um, we recognize that there are other um, modeling interests out there outside of the, the operational forecast model. And we want to create a, a space where members of the community can come together, work in an open and collaborative environment towards all water modeling outcomes, not just a forecast outcome. So we, community engagement, those are our, our key words, open source community development. Um, so in order to achieve this, we have to have three things in place. We have to have an engaged community we have to have an environment that people can come together and work, and we have to have a technology that enables them to do that work, a model that enables people to work with it. So I'm gonna to touch on what we're doing in each of these three aspects. So the first of these three aspects is community engagement. Um, we have started up uh, here at the, in the Office of Water Prediction, communities of practice around the, the national water model. Um, the, the first one that, that we have is a coastal coupling community of practice. And what we, we had our, our initial kickoff meeting right before the Summer Institute last year. And why I bring this up is, um, um, is that the, 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 the Summer Institute is, is critical in helping us build this community of practice. Um, we are, we, we have had about 150 uh, students come through the community um, and they, 
they are um, they are forming the, this this community that we hope to engage in the uh, development of the next generation of the national water model. Um, so we we held our kickoff meeting. The initial one was about the, the the coastal coupling, how we're engaging. We just wrapped up the 2019 AGU fall meeting last year, where we had a um, a town hall on the on the community of practice. Um, we're going to be at Ocean Sciences in February. We are um, working on a community charter. Um, uh, we're forming a, um, a, a steering committee. We're working on um, providing uh, better access to water model data in, in coastal um, areas. We have webinars. We're working on a, um, a website. We've just announced our next in-person meeting will be happening the week of May 11th here at the Water Center. Um, and so we're, we're, we're very um, interested in engaging the community in development, and this is how we are we're going about doing that. Um, the, the next aspect is the, the enabling environment. So one of the, the challenges that we have is um, w within our, with our partners, there are very strict rules about who can access federal IT systems and um, how, how we can pay for the, those IT systems. So being able to um, have an environment where researchers from academia, from the, the federal community, can come together and work in one environment and, um, and, and collaborate on model development is something that we've been working uh, very hard on. This is uh, something that some of the students at last year's Summer Institute did quite a bit of work on. Um, what is a what what does an evaluation environment look like for um, evaluating different components of models? Uh, we had a couple of extraordinarily good projects around the, this particular question um, last year. So the, the solution that we are developing is we're creating a an on-demand um, uh, model a, as a service, so that people, um, researchers, federal partners, students would be able to, without accessing a federal government um, IT system, you would be able to request a model run. Um, so you would configure. Let's say you wanted to change the parameters for infiltration in a, in a model. You would be able to, from an outside web interface, um, create a, a model run where you change those parameters where, wherever you want to run it. And from that, you would uh, send that to a, through the firewall to a scheduler where behind the scenes, the, the model would compile with your particular configuration, it would execute and it would send the data back to you along with evaluation statistics of, of that information. Um, so the, the, again, this was something supported out of last year's Summer Institute. Um, it's work that, that we are going to be continuing. We just have set up the initial demonstration of this. Um, if anybody was at HEU and saw Mel's talk on Friday afternoon, that was the initial demonstration of this, this capability. So this was built out of a, um, a brainstorming session here at the Water Center. Um, so behind the scenes, the, the request is verified. All the model inputs are configured. Um, it's run in a parallel system. We are running this here at the Water Center, not on high-performance computing, um, mind you and then it sends the output back to the user. So an example of the, the web interface, um, some more of the details, and an example of um, what the output would look like, which you would receive as a user. Um, you would get the raw output, but then you would have some visualization of uh, the, the model run as, as well. Um, here are some details. We're, we're running short on time, so I'm not going to uh, go through the details. Essentially, running on um, uh, off-the-shelf hardware that, that we're able to purchase for not that much money. 
Um, so we, we've containerized and, and distributed the water model execution. We have the, the, the Docker, um, that, that configuration support up to, or developed to support the, the initial distributed model run. We've configured the hardware. Um, we're, um, the, this in progress is mostly done now. We, we're done with the, the automatic staging and the request handling and the output processing work that we're going to be doing on this uh, this summer or this later this winter and early this summer is expanding the commute uh, the compute printing up uh, creating a, a more robust uh, a GUI integrating with our evaluation capabilities and integrating with a, a, a subset a subsetting service. The initial capability is going to be quite limited, but we anticipate that this will be something that will be developed, um, developed quite rapidly. So, other things that we're working on, um, um, uh, domain expansion, as I was just talking about, um, improving the, the, the forcing um, data that's available, um, expanding to other forcing products, uh, um, more options on configurations. Um, so th there's there's quite a bit of work left to do here, and we will be tackling that work in the um, coming months and years. So um, moving on to the last thing that I'm going to discuss uh, before we wrap up is the, the, the architecture. Um, I've already teased this a little bit, that um, Wharf Hydro is um, it's our solution now, but the, what we are rapidly working on our, our, what, what, the, what, what the evolution of that solution will be. And um, the, the idea here is to create a platform that can support multiple different modeling outcomes. Um, we, we essentially, in order to um, have a model that is tunable for different physics, we need to be able to support the, the, the physics options that, that we want in different domains of the model. We need to be able to have that um, happen at different time scales. At, we, be, we need to be able to run processes at different time scales and at different spatial scales. And so just since uh, this summer, I believe uh, graduation week of the Summer Institute, last year we had an initial requirements gathering process. And so we, we started looking at what the National Water Model Next Generation needs to be. And this is the list that they came up with. And how we're going to do this and what it's going to look like is we're going to, um, rather than invent a, our, our own data model or our own conceptual model, we're going to adopt something that, that is already out there in the community, such as the, the, the high features model. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced that this is the one that we're going to adopt yet. Um, I'm, I'm about 90% of the way there, but we're going to adopt something that is already out there in the in, in the community, um, and then we're going to make contributions back to the the, the community where um, there are aspects of the of the data model that, that don't necessarily fit our our needs. So again, about open source um, collaborative development. With people that are that are outside of our organization, um, what is particularly attractive about a model like High Features is it has um, standardized uh, conventions for um, how um, how th these uh, standard definitions, standard conventions. So, um, an example of how this is um, how we're going to be adopting these principles. A lot of us think about hydrology in, in this particular way. Um, we, or we approach hydrology in this way. We have a, um, a dendritic river network here represented by an overall catchment that has several different subcatchments. Um, so C1, C2, and C3. So these are all described within a, um, within the, the catchment hierarchy is, is described within the, the, the conceptual model um, and, and high features. So to, to solve this problem, we would normally uh, calculate 
the hydrologic signal in um, basin C2, um, uh, basin C3, calculate that at the, at the output of each one of those basins. We would combine that um, at where they come together at the, uh, the headwaters of basin C1. We would route that through basin C1. We would calculate the hydrologic signal from um, basin C1 and combine that with the, with the routed signal. And we would come up with um, some calculation at the outlet of C1 that we would combine with other, other, um, other sub-basins. And we would do this from the most hydrologically remote area in the entire country all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi, for instance. Um, and so what that looks like in terms of a, in, in terms of an architecture is you have different, different basins that have interfaces between them um, where they, they transmit information. Um, they're, they're related to each other. They transmit information through an interface. Um, a topography discontinuity um, or different sub-basins may share a um, uniform groundwater basin, for instance. So the groundwater basin may, um, may be continuous across uh, two different catchments, but the, the, the catchments may, may have remote um, surface hydrology. So um, that's an example of information that may be related uh, across, to, uh, across an interface. The nexus is where we combine the information um, from those two um, headwaters locations. And then we, we um, take that information and we relate that down through a, another catchment that would be C1 in the model. Um, we, we bring other information in at other nexus and um, continue on down, the, on down the network. The really powerful thing about thinking about hydrology in this way is it allows us to model um, or calculate uh, the, the hydrologic process in different ways. If you're doing hydrology in one catchment, you don't have to do the calculation the same in that catchment as you do in another catchment, as long as you are translating information across the interfaces and combining the information at, at, the, at the nexus points. And so if you want to um, 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 represent hydrology as a, as a boundary, as an area, as a dendritic network, uh, a hydrographic network, a flow network, however you want to um, represent hydrology, you're able to do in a framework like this, um, and as long as those conditions are met. So that we believe that this is our key to a multi-physics approach in the national water model. Um, um, we'll be able to, to calculate um, hydrology differently in the southeast versus the northeast versus the southwest versus the northwest. Um, so we're, we're very early in this concept, but this, this seems very exciting um, to us at this point. And so what this may look like is you can have a lumped catchment realization in the same um, hydrologic network as you have, or the same calculation uh, regime as you have it as a, as the a distributed catchment realization. Um, and we don't have to model at the same spatial scale. We don't have to model at the same temporal scale. Um, this allows us to have the flexibility and to model um, the way that it's most appropriate um, in different areas of, of the country, and even to support different modeling outcomes. Um, so this is fractal in nature. This can be extended as far up or as far down the, the, the network as, um, as possible. We can do this at any scale, even a hyper-resolution scale. Um, so we, we think that this is a, that this is a very promising um, technique. We're going to begin coding on this in fiscal year or in calendar year 2020. Um, so this is something that, that's very exciting to us. And we hope that what we learned through this year's Summer Institute will help inform how, what this architecture needs to look like, how we need to work, how we need to engage the community, 
and how we need to um, en enable that, that development in an open way. So I'm going to give some closing thoughts. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I would encourage everybody to start typing their questions in the in the chat box, and um, we'll we'll go ahead and try to answer as many of those as we can. So, the water model is um, it, it really is a, a great achievement, um, being that it is the first operational continental scale model running um, generating water prediction for for NOAA. Um, the the, the initial version was a was a quantum leap forward. Um, the, the subsequent upgrades have um, have all improved model skill, expanded its domain. We have come a long way even from that that initial um, that initial model um, deployment in August of 16. Um, we are continuing to rapidly do that version. 2.1 will be a step forward over where we are with 2.0, the current version. 3.0 will be an even bigger step forward. And um, even though we have a, a model that is producing stable forecast, it's producing, um, in some cases, skillful forecast, it doesn't really support the, the science that, that we would like to we would like to achieve. With such a platform, and so we are actively looking at um, what the next generation of the national water model will look like. Um, the Summer Institute is extraordinarily important for us in all of these endeavors. Um, being able to um, engage with the community, and not just the current community, the the community who's going to um, be the model developers and be um, the, the people who are coming up and, and running this but behind the, the, the people who are, are here today. Um, that's the, the community that we, that, that we are actively trying to engage. Um, so the, the work that you do helps to um, set the development direction of the model. It tells us a lot, and it, it really strengthens the, the, the uh, prospects for um, the, the future in, in the model. So. I'll close with uh, one of my favorite slides, which is um, a th this is the 2019 water year, an animation of that. Uh, this is the output of the, the analysis cycle of the national water model. And what you're looking at here is an animation of the of water moving through the nation's um, river network. And so I know we're about out of time. Um, I will. Um, Go ahead and let this run for a minute, and then I know the the, the um, Julia at Kawazi has a couple of things that she would like to remind you of. So, Julia, when when you're ready, um, the, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, please feel free to keep uh, inputting questions in the question box, uh, and we'll both uh, answer those in just a moment. I hate to interrupt this movie, but could you move on to the next slide? Uh, so I just wanted to go over a couple of details for logistical notes for this year's Summer Institute. Uh, next slide. Uh, Trey did a good job of going through a lot of the details um, and kind of giving an idea of uh, the role of the Summer Institute in the model. But just to reiterate, the one sentence summary the summer introduced an intensive summer program for graduate students to collect uh, to conduct group projects that involve rapid prototyping of new ideas, and it ultimately culminates in a capstone presentation and publishable science on aspects of the national water model. Um, could you move on to the next slide? And we're accepting applications now. Um, so eligibility, uh, you need to be a current graduate student affiliated with the U.S. University. But if that's not you and you just heard this presentation and you're disappointed, um, please think of any students or uh, mentees that uh, you have that might be a good fit for this program and send, on, um, send this information on to them and encourage them to apply. Uh, it's been a really great experience, not only for the skills that these students learn as future hydrologic, hydrologic modelers, but also as an opportunity to make connections within the water science community. Um, Students reside on site at the University of Alabama for the entire program, 
They must have a letter of endorsement from the faculty advisor. Um, and applications are closing January 13th. So uh, with holidays and everything coming up, uh, maybe talk to your advisors sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, we hope to see an application from you. Uh, you can apply through the proposal space on the Quasi website. Um, and that's all from me. There's an additional website, uh, additional webinar uh, on with more logistical details about the Summer Institute that's currently on the Quasi website now. Um, feel free to check that out or reach out to me if you have any additional logistical questions uh, for this upcoming Summer Institute. And with that, let's look at the questions. So, uh, Trey, this first one is, how much of the Summer Institute would involve actual development of the national model? Do you want to speak on that? Yeah, so um, you won't be working with the, 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 the water model itself. Um, you will be working with either a cutout of the model that can help you to um, elucidate some of the, the processes that need to be improved. Um, we will uh, take what the, the information that you develop and incorporate that into our um, in, into our our planning for future upgrades. Um, but you will not be working on the on the model itself. The next one is in the next generation architecture. What does infrastructure or where does infrastructure enter into the network topology? Okay, so. The, the the analogy that I like to use about the, um, the 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 next generation is it's essentially um, we're, we're creating an, an operating system like is, like is on your phone. Um, so I use an Apple phone, no endorsement um, implied here, but I, I use an Apple phone, and so I have an iOS that uh, that is the operating system that supports all of the different apps. Um, the next generation infrastructure is um, the operating system. It's the iOS that supports the the apps at the different um, in, in different areas. So the the um, the really that's the the best analogy that I have. We're we're creating this um, the, this infrastructure that. Um, Individual app developers. Let's say you are the the world's foremost expert in infiltration processes. That you would be able to write the infiltration app for a particular um, domain, and um, if, if that app is indeed a uh, is indeed an improvement, we will um, um, take that and incorporate it into the the operational national water model. So I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure that that I picked up on the nuance there, but um, but let's let's go on to the next one. So I think we have a chance for one or two more. Um, can we access archived model flow data going back 10 or 20 years, and how would we do that? Yes, you can. So there is a with every version of the model. We produce a retrospective analysis. Um, it's available through Amazon Web Services, uh, um, through the, the big data partnership that, that NOAA has. So if you um, Google National Water Model Retrospective Run, it should take you to a, um, a page. And I believe Kawazi has some of the, the, the water model data as well. Um, so yes, that data is out there. Uh, hourly data going back 26 years, and in 2.1, it'll be going back 40 years, 41 years. Awesome. Um, I don't think we have time for any more questions, but feel free to follow up um, with either of us afterwards. My email is uh, on the screen, and I'll be happy to pass on any additional questions as needed. I wanted to thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Again, I'm Julia. Feel free to reach out. Um, also, feel free to use the Quasi website as a resource for more information on updates on the Summer Institute itself and the National Water Center um, Office of Water Predictions website.
Additionally, if you're going to be at AMS in Boston in January, come say hi. Quasi staff will have a booth in the exhibition hall. And finally, a big thank you to Trey Flowers at the National Water Center for your time and expertise. And thank you again for training in this presentation. Um, so this webinar will be available on the website in the coming days. And have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you.